Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. There's a, more than a couple of handfuls of people out there still mulling over Ambassador Sherman's remarks, I think, um, uh, which were fantastic. And in a lot of ways, that makes this panel almost anticlimactic. Um, it's, uh, uh, but, uh, but that's okay. We'll forge ahead. Um, uh, so uh, I'm Ken Medlock. I'm the director of the Center for Energy Studies here at the Baker Institute. And um, I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, two speakers we have uh, today. Um, we're going to start sort of in reverse order uh, uh, in the program. We're going to start with Greg Pretty. He's director of uh, Global Natural Resources Group at, Eur at Eurasia Group. Uh, and we'll follow him up with uh, Scott Modell, um, who is uh, uh, at the Rapidon Group, uh, managing director there, and also who's a non-resident non, uh, position at CSIS. Um, I'm not going to read bios. Uh, I think that's counterproductive. It sort of kills airtime. Uh, you have those in front of you, should you like to look into them. Suffice it to say, uh, these two individuals have a lot, of, uh, a lot to say, and it's, um, uh, I think you'll see that they're both very knowledgeable on this subject. Uh, in particular, uh, what we're going to be addressing in the final part of the program is what are the implications of, of the reemergence of Iran for not only regional but global uh, uh, energy markets? And you know, one of the things that sort of fascinates me about this subject is something that we really started to hit on in a study we did uh, and published back in 2007 uh, here at the Baker Institute um, uh, on the geopolitics of natural gas. So this is a natural gas focused issue, but it's inescapable to recognize that, that Iran uh, is endowed uh, with one of the largest natural gas uh, resource bases in the world. Um, and it's largely underutilized. Um, primarily used for domestic consumption with uh, uh, some interconnections north uh, via pipeline, but that's pretty much it. Um, you couch that in the glo broader global context of economic growth uh, that's largely occurring in the most populous region of the world, which collectively, collectively is India, the ASEAN countries, and China, over 3 billion people. Um, all of these countries are uh, emerging giants, collectively and individually. And when you think about that, and you think about the geographic location of Iran, and the fact that development in this part of the world is going to require uh, a tremendous amount of energy resource, um, it, it sort of becomes inescapable to begin to wonder, well, what sort of new geopolitical challenges might emerge over the next two, uh, uh, two or three decades, uh, in particular as investment capital flows from these countries into Iran. And of course, with the lifting of, uh, of various uh, sanctions, um, this is looking more and more like a reality. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to turn the floor first over to Greg. Um, we are all going to sit in the audience so we can watch the slides. And then Scott will, will step up to the podium. And then we will actually all sit up here and uh, uh, have a nice conversation that hopefully involves you uh, more than me. Uh, Greg? Thank you, Ken, for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief. It's obviously a very uh, broad-ranging subject, uh, but you know what I'm going to do with this presentation is tie it into what this means for uh, for the oil market and for the oil industry. Um, you know, over the, both looking at how the sanctions have played out and the impact that they had on the broader market, and then how that's how that looks going forward. Yeah, I think that the main takeaways, uh, you know, that I'd like to leave with everybody, um, you know, the, the, the sanctions uh, that were in place for the, the four years between 2012 and 2015 had really uh, helped to maintain price stability and stave off uh, the day of reckoning from oversupply. So you had, uh, you know, demand growing uh, slower than supply uh, during the U.S. shale boom, but that was kind of masked for a while um, by the impact of sanctions taking off that volume. Um, the removal of those constraints on Iran is going to contribute on the, on the other side of the rebalancing to extending the glut. Uh, unfortunately for oil producers, it's coming back uh, at the wrong time, and it's putting additional volume on that's going to push back the date at which the rebalancing in the market leads to a, a draw on in global inventories. Um, we don't see any real potential for OPEC action. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, um, but you know this is one uh, you know political constraint uh, inhibiting any effective cartel behavior, which probably wouldn't make sense based on the economics anyway. 
Um, we also see uh, you know Iran's increased volumes uh, returning uh, you know to European markets and elsewhere, um, which is setting up a struggle for market share. We're already starting to see some of that in pricing differentials, and you know the last the last kind of big picture point is that we don't see investment in Iran's upstream taking off rapidly. Um, you know even as they move forward with the Iran petroleum contract, um, and recent developments have have made our view on that even a little bit more pessimistic. You know, when you when you look back at the uh, the period uh, when sanctions were in effect, and, and and I think the key point here is sanctions have not been completely removed. Um, you know, there there were essentially three layers of sanctions in place. Um, you know, the, the National Defense Authorization Act sanctions, uh, which were passed in tw late 2011, um, that was what constrained volumes through secondary banking sanctions. But it also did a few other things that were important, uh, including, uh, you know, effectively cutting off NIOC's ability, the national, the national oil company in Iran, um, to import goods and services to support the industry. The Iran Sanctions Act in 96, uh, you know, which is still in effect, uh, had, uh, you know, targeted secondary sanctions on companies that invested uh, significant amounts in Iran's upstream, so cutting off foreign investment flows for a much longer period. But then there's a, a layer of sanctions uh, that is not linked to the nuclear issue, that you know, t sanctions related to terrorism, which are U.S. primary sanctions. Uh, they're still around. They, you know, some of that dates back to the Carter era. Um, but we see that as still having a, you know an important effect on doing business in Iran for reasons that uh, I'll get to. Um, but uh, you know, the loss of a, when you look at the uh, the volume in this uh, this chart is a zero uh, a zero axis, so it probably should have started a little bit higher than that. But you essentially have this period in uh, late 2011 where the Saudis ramped up very uh, sharply um, in anticipation and to reassure the market before sanctions on Iran took place um, and. They've essentially kept that market share. So that extra million barrels a day that Iran lost, roughly, uh, the Saudis took that. And their drive to keep market share at present, if you look at that from the Iranian perspective, that's important context you know, in terms of how they see it. Um, and this is a graph that illustrates um, you know, quantitatively uh, some of what I had just outlined there. This, the red line is the net delta upward from January 2011 in U.S. liquids production. So as the shale boom starts to take off, and particularly in 2012 uh, through the middle of 2014, it's largely masked by unplanned o OPEC outages. Um, you know, we were lucky late 2011 uh, when Gaddafi finally fell, Libya surprised on the upside. Most analysts didn't see it recovering that quickly, and its recovery helped avoid what might have been too tight a market as a result of Iran's volumes coming off. But then when Iran came off um, you know, in 2012, um, you, you had the Saudis making up that volume, spare capacity thinned out, but it did effectively mask the impact of the shale boom. And you had a period where you know, global capacity, counting these outages, was growing quite a bit faster than demand. Demand, but the market didn't really need to take that into account because those, that capacity was constrained by these outages. Um, and so that had the effect of propping up prices in what was from 2011 through the first half of 2014, it was a remarkable period of price stability. We averaged over $100 a barrel each of those years, and with the exception of one brief dip um, and a brief Saudi cut uh, that pushed that back up uh, in 20, late 2012, um, you know, that had essentially supported the U.S. shale boom and the growth rate there. And so when you look at the, uh, you know, the impact on prices here, uh, this was, uh, you know, a period of remarkable stability. Um, you, know, you had this initial run-up uh, at the beginning of this graph in 2011 that was largely about the Arab Spring and the Libyan Civil War, um, but not a lot of price movement uh, during that period. And now, looking forward, um, you know, this is a, a graph that shows, uh, you know, the prices uh, for Brent uh, and Iran's production levels starting in January 15, uh, you know, up through February this year. And, uh, you know, I, th I think that this is, you know, coming back into the market at this point in the, the glut that's been building, it really just, you know, when, when it became clear that the JCPOA was going to happen, the market did start to price in this view that it's going to take longer for the market to balance. 
and a lot, also a lot of uncertainty about just how much the Iranians could bring back into the market um, based on how long it had been shut in and how little was known externally about the exact state of the infrastructure there. Um, it was kind of, you know, as you can see at the end of this graphic, it's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, buy the rumor, sell the fact situation, uh, you know, in reverse, if you will, in that, uh, you know, when they finally got sanctions relief, and with a number of other reasons in play, prices started to come back up. Um, you know, I think that the, the current rally has probably run its course and we're gonna flatten out for a while and maybe dip a bit, um, but uh, you know, I won't go into all of the reasons behind that in this presentation. And uh, you know, we think that the, uh, based on estimates that we've done uh, looking at drilling activity and how they shut in the production, we think that their claim that they can do an initial ramp of 500,000 barrels a day um, you know, by the end of this, the second quarter this year is actually quite credible. Um, you know, the way that they shut in the production with well chokes, um, and they also had been drilling approximately 300 new wells a year, um, you know, that, that does not imply that they didn't have any spare capacity, which a few bullish analysts had, had argued. There are some constraints, though, that are, that are still making it difficult for them to do business. They can't clear U.S. dollar transactions, uh, which is the currency that the transactions for oil are normally carried out in. Um, and U.S. primary sanctions remaining, uh, you know, against a lot of companies and individuals in Iran also raise uh, concerns among a lot of non-U.S. companies that may, there may not be secondary sanctions, but they don't want to do business with those people. So that throws up a lot of obstacles. One of those is tanker insurance, which has been an important one for shipments to Europe, um, with some of the Euro big European ship insurers unwilling to do business with them. And the other one that's, that's interesting and kind of geopolitically driven is they haven't been able to get access to the Sumed pipeline and the Egyptian terminal on the Mediterranean uh, where that's loaded. That used to be an important conduit for Iranian barrels going into the Mediterranean, particularly to Greece, which was a big market for them, um, and that has not been restored, partially because there's uh, you know, Saudi partial ownership of the Sumed pipeline, which seems to be influencing that. And then when this looks at uh, you know, our view of the, the Iranian ramp up. We think that you know, it will be pretty substantial. You get that initial 500. And then after that, we think that you could get, and this is a little bit less certain, you could get a little bit of additional upside over the following year or so um, based on being able to access imports of goods and services for the industry. So all those uh, things where you had a broken pump and you couldn't order a, a part from the source in South Korea, now that you've got that and you've got the money to do it, those things are going to get fixed. We don't think there's going to be any uh, production restraint. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the Doha meeting this weekend at length, even though there's, there's been a lot of uh, you know, talk about that the press and in the financial markets this week. Um, you know, the, the things that are inhibiting cartel behavior right now, the most important of them is simply the fact that with the economics of shale production in the US, the, dr the wells that have been drilled but not completed, there's still a backlog of those. There's an understanding on the part of the Saudis that if they were to uh, restrain output, make any cuts, they would simply be bringing back on competing production, you know, preventing the decline in U.S. output and other non-OPEC output that, that should take place this year on a baseline scenario. And the only way you would get that market share back, at least in the next few years, would be to drive prices down again and uh, you know, get it to where uh, you, you could shove those barrels back in, but you wouldn't be, um, you know, gain, regaining that market share would not be easy. But, uh, you know, we don't think Russia would cut. Part of that is technical because they have, uh, you know, water cut uh, that's, that's in, you know, the pipes would literally freeze in the winter. But the Iran-Saudi dynamic is another important layer to that. As I alluded to earlier, the Iranians essentially look at Saudis, the Saudis' massive financial reserves, and you can do the math on where prices would have been otherwise, where Saudi volumes would have been otherwise. There's an enormous amount of the Saudi cash reserves right now that are attributable to the windfall that they reaped from sanctions. And so we see this leading to a uh, you know a pretty stiff competition for market share, uh, you know everywhere other than the U.S. Uh, where or, you know you really have. With production going up in Iraq, you know they were up over 700,000 barrels a day year on year last year. You've got Iran recovering, and you've also got the Saudis maintaining output levels. Um, you know th they're trying to sell those into the same markets. Demand is growing, but that's 
you know, with the stock building right now, there, there really is, that, that increased volume is leading to uh, competitive discounting on the differentials. Um, I just written something about that uh, earlier this week, but we're seeing some Iranian grades uh, that used to be, you know, the Iranian medium sour exports that used to be priced at a slight premium to the competing Saudi grade, those are, that's now flipped. So they're, they're discounting to get around the inconvenience of Euro transactions and not using dollars uh, and all of that and, and put those barrels into those markets. And of course, they can't sell to the US, so they need to sell it into Europe and Asia. And the hurdles are probably a little bit higher uh, with some of those headwinds to selling to Europe. Uh, this is also, you know, when you think about the geopolitical impact of it, it's definitely driving the Saudis, uh, you know, to want to deepen their footprint uh, on the downstream side in Asia to, you know, they, in a number of places like the U.S., like China, they own refining assets that have underpinned those volumes. Um, and I think this has kind of upped the sense of urgency that, that they have about, you know, the, the big growth market in the future in Asia is going to be India, even as global demand growth is slowing, and it's certainly slowing in China. And uh, you know, getting into the Indian downstream, I think, has become a pretty big uh, priority for the Saudis. Uh, China, you know, another another uh, important point here: the Chinese had gone up to about 20 percent at some points in Saudi market share of Chinese imports. That's higher than they generally like to go. It's kind of seen as an unofficial policy cap for them. Um, and the Saudi market share is being squeezed down now in a way that the Saudis don't particularly like because of that diversification strategy on behalf of China. Um, and so more Iranian barrels have been going into China, even as Chinese demand growth has slowed. And uh, I also wanted to talk a bit about the, uh, you know, the outlook for investment and growth. Um, you know, where do we go after that initial recovery period of, say, the first 18 months after uh, sanctions relief? Iran is one of those few countries that has immense reserves with low production costs um, and, uh, you know, has not, er, has not ever come near its potential in terms of volumes, at least not unless you go way back to the 1970s, and it's still way below those levels. Um, but our view has been that the, uh, the outlook for huge amounts of capital to come into Iran and investment, at least for the next couple of years, is going to be pretty slow off the mark. There will be some, um, but there are a lot of hurdles to that. Um, you know, this Iran petroleum contract that they had rolled out, uh, you know, toward the end of last year, um, it's, it's very telling that they canceled the London Roadshow for that, which was supposed to be held in January, ostensibly because of delays in getting visas, but it was pretty clear that they just still had internal disagreements at high levels about exactly what they ought to be offering and didn't want to put a draft document uh, out there uh, that would start circulating. Um, but the IPC, from what they have said about it late last year, um, you know, it's a service contract. It probably wouldn't allow for the booking of reserves. Um, it's an improvement on the Iraq service contract model in that it has significant upside when prices recover or if prices were to go up um, on the per barrel fees, but that's still kind of the, the closest analogy to, to the structure of it um, is, the, is the Iraqi model. This is, this is sort of an improved version of that. And that's actually a bit different um, than late 2014 at the OPEC meeting they had shopped around a, a rough draft of, an, of another very different contract that tried to approximate a production sharing contract while fudging the issue of ownership of reserves in the ground. They have a constitutional barrier to that, just like Mexico does, with a formula about owning a, a legally protected right to revenue from that after it comes out of the ground, which you know is, is bookable because it's financially identical. Um, so they've essentially, they've moved back from what was a very industry-friendly stance, at least in that initial uh, draft that they circulated, uh, you know, over a year ago, to something that was much less favorable. And now, what we've been hearing, uh, you know, in recent weeks is that this is getting pulled back, reviewed again, marked up, and some of the sweeteners that were still in it are being taken out. We don't have specifics on that, but I think when a new document comes out and when they finally try to move forward uh, with a bid round on some of the projects they'd like to move forward with, um, it's probably going to be less favorable than what they were talking about last year and may get a, a disappointing initial response. Um, 
you know, also, you know, some, some of the speakers this morning had alluded to the political context for this is complicated. Um, you know, there are elements, uh, you know, in hardliners in Iran who would see the uh, success of an economic opening and, and uh, foreign companies operating in Iran as something that might undermine their position eventually. Um, and so, you know, there definitely are people who have ideological, not strictly economic, uh, reasons uh, to oppose, uh, you know, an opening like this in generous terms for foreign companies. Um, the other, uh, you know, the other uh, issue here is, um, you know, some of those. There, there's a structure where they have to set up joint ventures, um, you know, for Iranian companies having 51 percent uh, of the JVs. And that, uh, you know, is a problem on several levels. One, it's, it's not optimal operationally for the IOCs that would be looking at this. But it also, um, you know, those companies are, in some cases, have individuals involved, or in some cases, the corporate entities that would be involved um, are still tied into U.S. Uh, primary sanctions lists, and that would present a lot of concerns. And so I think that, particularly for some of the Western IOCs, the way that this may play out is there will be a protracted negotiation about, you know, even if the contract is minimally, uh, you know, economically acceptable for some of the fields. There's going to be a protracted process of we have to get these individuals and entities away from this, um, and that's going to slow things down. So we, we don't see Iranian volumes really, uh, you know, taking off uh, in a in a large way, uh, you know, in the next five years. Um, yeah, I think the other uh, the other kind of broad points that you could make about this. Um, you know, one is that with the, with capex in general, uh, you know, at very low levels, this isn't a good time to be doing this. The bar is going to be very high. But also, even when you look forward to you know when the market recovers and when we're starting to reach FIDs on new long lead time projects, there are a lot of other places that you can put your money other than Iran. Um, and so even even with the very low production costs, you know, if it's not a uh, you know a more generous set of fiscal terms, and with all the concerns about will the agreement hold up, would snapback sanctions happen, would a new government in Washington change anything, um, it's going to be a pretty hard sell, uh, protect, particularly for the big Western IOCs. And so I think that you know the early investment that you'll see flow in may actually you know. Asian companies will probably be in the forefront with some of the initial things, um, and uh, that may be uh, dusting off some of the old contracts that existed that Chinese companies have at this point, uh, you know, like Azadegan and Yadavaran. Um, those are probably the first things that would move. Um, but even that, uh, we don't see a lot of indication that these are going to move very rapidly. And with that, I will, uh, will conclude my remarks. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Ken. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Greg, thanks for getting all of that that fancy market lingo out of the way. Uh, I was I was we were, I was going to come here to talk a little bit about some of the things that that Greg touched on in terms of Iran and where it's going and what its return to oil markets actually means. But in reality, I think the real value that I have to offer here is based on my own experience. I was in I was in the CIA for about 15 years. Uh, overseas and director of operations, and of course I focused on Iran. And in focused on Iran, uh, I learned a lot of things about this global apparatus that they have and how they go about doing what they do. So when you put it in the context of what we're looking at now, which is Iran's oil return, there's a couple things that I think are worth pointing out. Uh, I'm glad that, that Ambassador Sherman pointed out the $100 billion return. Everybody's talking about that. Everybody's all worked up about what is this $100 billion going to mean? All of a sudden, the IRGC codes force is going to be flush with cash, and they're going to do things that nobody's ever thought they were going to do, and they're going to wreak havoc 10 times worse than they ever did before. And I think it's I just think it's, fa it's a fallacy. A lot of that money has been committed, and I don't think that's the direction they're headed in right now with regard to that money. Uh, and I think the other point that she made is it doesn't really take a lot of money to do what they're doing around, around the region. Le when I came back from, uh, from living overseas, one of the questions I was asked is, why is the U.S. government more successful or less successful 
than other governments? Or why do some governments fail in terms of trying to project what they do in their own countries, or particularly around the region, or beyond the region? And I started to think critically about the US government and how it's organized and our, what we call in DC at least, a whole of government approach to trying to get things done. Now, a whole of government approach is a nice way of saying, can't we just get all, all agencies to work together and find ways of, of pushing forward our objectives? And it rarely works, and, there's, and people generally go back into their lanes and do what they do. But nevertheless, I think when you compare what the US government does and looks like uh, in terms of how it's uh, spread out around the world, it's more effective than most countries for a lot of reasons. And one is consistency, one is the resources we commit, and one is the fact that we have a very multidimensional, uh, layered approach to, you know, from grassroots up uh, to developing influence and pushing forward our objectives. And I mention that, not to say the US government is perfect, because by no means is it, uh, but when you look at Iran and the way that Iran approaches the, 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 the task of, of its own power projection in the region and beyond the region, one thing you see, and it's very clear, it's, it's very, very stark, is the difference between Iran and what their regional and global apparatus looks like and that of the Saudis, for instance, or any other, uh, any other of their sectarian competitors or just regional competitors, however you want to frame it. They're very different. They take the closest thing that you could call a whole of government approach to developing influence around the region. Now, the fact, let's tie it back into energy. As they're coming back into energy uh, and ramping up, uh, ramping up their, um, their production, they do have more money. It's going to allow them to do more things. And if you look back to 2011, 2011, the Supreme Leader was talking to the econ minister, and he's talking to, to, to the people around him. And he's saying, well, if the Americans are going to go forward with multilateral sanctions, well, of course, the world cannot live without Iranian oil, and the price is going to skyrocket. This is going to fail. And if the Americans want to go off on this unilateral course, as they always have, let them do it. Well, that didn't turn out to be the case. 2012, 2013 comes in. The pressure is mounting on Iran. It's mounting on the Supreme Leader. And the technocratic government that Rouhani surrounded himself with started to tell him, listen, we really need to get a deal with the Americans not because of rapprochement, but because we need to rescue the economy. And the only way to do that is to strike a deal. And you need to understand, you may be a revolutionary and not an economist and so forth, but the realities of the Iranian economy as a result of these multilateral sanctions are grim, and they're crushing us. And, it, and, and one of the earlier speakers today did say, and maybe it was Ambassador Sherman, the sanctions did bring them to the negotiating table. It was very true. The stream of information that we regularly got on what people were saying to the Supreme Leader, and it took some convincing. For a while, he's obstinate, and a lot of the hardliners around him are saying that's fine because there were naturally there were interests that were served by having this belligerent posture towards the United States. But eventually, he came around. Um, but I would say, when you look at whether it's Iran before the return of sanctions, you know, before the JCPOA or after the JCPOA, uh, it doesn't take a lot of money to do what they're doing. Uh, most of what they do is grassroots. They're not spending millions and millions of dollars in places building mosques. It's down to cultural centers, it's down to funding proxies. Um, one of the things that convinced the Supreme Leader uh, to, say, to, to actually go and support Rouhani, keep the conservatives to the extent he could in check uh, to get the JCPOA done, to get the nuclear deal done, was the fact that actually pressure was so great in this instance that they did have to cut back funding. They actually had to turn to Hezbollah and people that they'd always funded and they'd always facilitated. The, group, the key players part that were part of their global apparatus were suddenly finding themselves without money and without resources. And uh, once that sunk in, they realized, OK, we need a deal. And the interesting thing, when you think about it, um, Iran's own operations in places as important as Iraq because we need to make the distinction between some of the far-flung places that Iran is trying to develop influence in, like Latin America and parts of Africa and its own region. Uh, and when it has to stop actual units from operating in a place like Iraq, right in its backyard, probably one of the most critical projects, foreign policy projects that it's had uh, in 37 years, uh, you know things are bad, and that's what forced them to the table.
In the, I'd like to talk a little bit about 2009. Let me just go back to 2009 a little bit. A number of people have talked about the Green Movement. A number of people have talked about reform and what it means, what the, US, what the United States government should or should not do. Maybe it's best. One, one speaker suggested don't do anything, because every time the United States touches any faction within Iran, it actually backfires. So in 2009, I was in a position where uh, I, I was in charge of Iranian, internal Iranian operations. The brave people who were the people who were actually brave enough to work for us during that time, and the elections happened in 2009. And after the elections, the protests started, and the supreme leader at the time totally underestimated how big these protests were going to be. There had been student protests before. People thought they were going to bubble up and then die down. People thought they could be controlled, and then all of a sudden, this movement springs up, and even Mosavi was caught off guard, and Karabi, the supposed leaders of this. And at the time, we were approached. We in the CIA were approached by people that were affiliated directly with this movement. And they said, listen, we don't want guns. We don't want to overthrow the regime. We don't want to kill the system. But what do we do? We could use some support. Will President Obama come out and say something in the interest of free and fair elections or social justice or anything that might give us a little, a little bit more momentum? And at the time, I didn't know until, until, until later, and, and I think Ambassador Sherman talked about it, they had, we, the, the, the Obama administration had just begun the process of reaching out. Uh, they sent letters to the Supreme Leader. They wanted to start a second channel of dialogue. And we were told to stand back, and, and we did. So when you saw the agitators in the street, and I think uh, one of the speakers earlier was saying, well, wait a minute, if that's the case, if you guys, if there was sort of a moratorium placed on the agency dealing with the Green Movement, then why were these violent protests? Who was pushing? Most of the people were peaceful. Where did this violence come from? We all thought, we Iranians all thought, that it was the agency that was provoking these internal networks and agitating, and, and that, was, that was part of, an, of a sort of an incipient effort to overthrow and actually give them the momentum they needed to take it to the next level. And, that, and I can tell you that wasn't the case at all. We pulled back, and the rest is history, as you know. But at that time, I want to tell you an interesting story, Khamenei got everyone together at the peak of the protests. He called in the people from the IRGC. He called in the people from the Ministry of Intelligence. He called in the people from, from the law enforcement forces, all the key security, the besiege. And he said, we have our own, you have your own interagency security differences. Everybody has their own uh, ability or inability to work with one another. This has gotten to the point now, this, this green movement, where we have no choice but to come together. We have to come together. This is an existential movement for the revolution. And he started to talk in a room full of people about how had the Shah in the early to mid-70s done more to get a handle on what the clerical movement was, what Khomeini's vision was, had he done more to repress us, and it, maybe we wouldn't be here today. It was an existential moment for the Shah. Either he didn't realize it, he didn't take it, he didn't take swift action, and the rest is history, and here we are. And he said the same thing in the early 80s. When Khomeini was there, and the revolution had happened, and he comes back into Iran. There's, a, there's this variety of groups, and there were periods of uncertainty. The MEK was there, and there was others. They did, viewed that as an existential moment, and they had to take very difficult decisions. Well, Khamenei compared those two to 2009. Late 2009, early 2010, when they said, we have to come together. This movement has to be crushed, because the revolution has to live on. And that's exactly what they did. So when you look at going forward, one of the things I think has been touched on today, rightfully so, is the issue of succession. So if there was a political issue in the na over the last 20 years uh, that would determine the, the, you know, the, the, tra the um, trajectory of the Middle East in a lot of ways, it's succession. It's Khamenei, what happens when he is gone? Who comes next? It's a critical issue. But one of the things I would say, whether you think it's Rouhani, whether you think it's somebody else, it's another conservative, it's a hardliner like Khamenei, regardless of whatever you think it is, Going back to the U.S. government and the Iranian government and how there's a similarity in terms of the extent to which they really have gone out of their way to build a multi-layered apparatus for pursuing their objectives. The Iranians have done something that nobody else in the region has done, and that is when they go into Bahrain or when they go to the Emirates or when they go into Iraq, they approach it uh, as if they have to win over people in every dimension and every level of that society. And that's exactly what they've done in, in, in parts of Iraq. That's what they're trying to do and failing a lot of places. But they're doing it everywhere they can. 
and it is on the ground and is pushing forward all the time. In the same way the United States has money and programs and people doing various things to try to win over influence, okay, whether it's trade or whether it's political relations, they're doing the exact same thing. So in light of Iran-Saudi today, when you look at Iran-Saudi, you say, well, wait a minute. Doha is the, is the topic of the moment. Uh, crude prices went from 27 to $43, bumped up, and everybody's happy uh, because, um, you know, everybody was complaining to the Saudis, we, this is unsustainable, we can't take this anymore. There's got to be some, some sort of intervention. So they went along with this verbal intervention, and now everybody's looking at April 17th and saying, well, what are the Saudis going to do? Can the Saudis and the Iranians agree? Can they get along and agree to continue to prop up the market with this kind of artificial verbal intervention, even though nobody's going to cut, even though no, the Iranians aren't going to freeze their production? We all know that. Can they get along in this dimension, but yet be at odds with one another, be it you know, fighting with one another, arguably at, a, at, a, at a, the worst it's been in a long time, can they do the same thing? Can they do those both at the same time? And, and a lot of people don't think they can. I, for one, particularly think they can. Based on my understanding, it's that uh, Zangane uh, has been empowered. He's been, you know, they've, they've said, if you can get a deal that helps oil prices, that's fine. Because at the end of the day, our number one concern here is the continuity of the regime. It's the continuity of the regime. This needs to stay in power. And the higher oil prices are, the better it is for everybody. So do what you need to do. That has nothing to do with rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. That they can do both at the same time. And when you look at, I mean, if it was just up to Naimi, who was the, who was the oil minister in the late 90s, and so was Zengene, they could get in a room and probably figure out a way to get this done. But there's a geopolitical dimension to it that makes it much more complicated. And time will tell. But I, I honestly believe that when you look at you know, in the aftermath of the nuclear deal, as, crude, as Iran's crude exports ramp up, as money starts to come back in, as they normalize relations with m most of the rest of the world, uh, and as Greg pointed out, there's going to be some speed bumps, and that's going to take longer in some ways than Iran would like, um, they have more money, and they have more cash, and, they have, and they're already ramping up. I mean, I, I appreciate the rosy optimism from some about how we're, if, you know, there is a fundamental compatibility, which I do agree with, that the U.S. and Iran at some point could come together and do things together, whether it's counterterrorism, whether it's restoring re relations, whether it's coming together in the form of a cold peace, because Iranians have told me that. Even Iranians who are in the GOATS wars, even Iranians who are in Ministry of Intelligence, it, they're more nationalistic than they are religious. Not all the time, but there really is a nationalistic drive when you talk to them. And those are their marching orders, and that's how they're going to carry them out. And I, I think... Getting back to the apparatus, even if you start to see fundamental steps in the direction of U.S.-Iran rapprochement, even if that were to happen, and I'm not saying we're seeing it, you have programs and people and, and, and objectives that, and embassies that are doing the things they've always done and units they've, they've always done. The Iranians have operated their diplomacy as covert action for a long time. So you've got intelligence officers or IRGC military men who are ambassadors. And you have them working in the embassy, out of the embassy. And they're always, ne out of necessity, they decided long ago that there had to be a clandestine component to the way they went about diplomacy. And that continues to this day. And they've moved their entire foreign policy making implementation apparatus so far in that direction, you don't turn that off in a day or a week or a year. It's going to take a long time to reverse that course. And to give you just a, an example, maybe it's not the best example, but after 9-11, I remember the agency they said, okay, a lot of you in certain places where there's, where there, that aren't hotbeds of terrorism, uh, we want to change your operational directives, the list of priorities that you have to collect on, right? So if you're in Vienna, uh, you know, we now want you to collect on terrorism and terrorists. And we said, well, how are we going to do that? There's, no, there, 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 there's nobody here. You know, and later we went on to realize that maybe, maybe there were financial nodes and so forth, counter threat finance, but, but in reality, it didn't make sense. So even though the objectives came from the National Security Council and the White House, at the end of the day, the business remained the same. The, what we did every day remained the same. Nothing changed. And that was after arguably the, one of the most important events uh, in the last, certainly in my lifetime, 9-11. That, that built entire government bureaucracies around it. So when you say, is Iran going to change? Are there signs Iran is going to change? Even if you see positive steps, my argument is it's going to take a long time to even reel in, much less dismantle, what Iran is up to and how it's pushing forward in ways that are antithetical to US interests. Uh, that's, that's, I think that's where I'd leave it. I'd certainly welcome the opportunity to talk 
more about where I see Iran going. Uh, Saudi perspectives, I think we hear a lot from Saudis on what they think Iran is up to. With the, forget about setting aside the nuclear issue. That if you just talk, take Hezbollah. And the, and the Saudis' perception of what Iran is doing with Hezbollahization, if you will, uh, reactivating units that, whether it's Hezbollah Hijaz, Hezbollah Bahrain, Hezbollah Kuwait, things that came and went. S sometimes they pulled off big attacks. Sometimes they were agitators. Sometimes they, they burrowed in and, and actually helped Iran establish foothold of interest in certain places. But for the most part, they eventually just faded away. Has, the, the point is the Saudi perception is that Iran is trying to resurrect these, uh, they're trying to, to, trying to make a cookie cutter version of Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah, which it views as its most successful foreign policy experiment in 37 years. They're trying to do that and replicate that around the region. That perception exists. Mohammed bin Salman is an aberration in terms of what he's trying to do and inter by intervening and being so aggressive and forward leaning in the region goes against everything that Saudis have established as a track record of a very standoffish foreign policy, very neutral foreign policy. He's taking, it's taking Saudi Arabia in a totally different direction. And I would add that he's taking, he's taking the Iranian, he wants to take the Iranians head on. And by trying to take the Iranians head on, he's really outmatched. And he's going to run into some real problems. And the Iranians know that. And the Iranians are perfectly content to continue this asymmetric warfare and go head to head with the Saudis. They don't want to have war in a conventional sense with the Saudis, but they're more than happy to continue, and out of nationalism, not even out of sectarianism, as somebody pointed out earlier, simply because there really is a true deep dislike or maybe even hatred in some cases of the Saudis. And they're going to continue to push forward, and it is a competition of states there. And until there's a rapprochement there, you, they are really outmatched, and the Iranians are going to continue to push forward on that. And the, and the and, in terms of the rebound of Iran, the normalization of Iran, bringing them back into uh, the you know, global oil markets, you know, you have a real you have a real difficult challenge ahead of you in terms of, of of dislodging the IRGC and other sanctioned entities, entities that will remain sanctioned for terrorism, and human rights, from the oil and gas sectors, whether it's crude swaps in Central Asia, whether it's you know taking crude across the border in Afghanistan, whether it's oil in Khuzestan. Uh, there's a number of ways in which the IRGC is going to continue to illicit, illicitly and illicitly earn money. So figuring out how European, forget US, European companies are eventually going to navigate the minefield of business in Iran, given the fact that you have this multitude of IRGC entities that's continuously growing and that's going to try to adapt to this post-nuclear commercial world where you've got people really seriously looking about investing lots of money is an ominous challenge. And I think I agree with Greg that our core assessment is it's going to be very difficult for a number of major companies, particularly banks, to jump back into Iran. With that, I'll conclude. Well, thank you for the, for the comments from both of you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the, the Q&A, and then I'll open the floor up to questions. But <clears throat> Scott, I'm going to start with you, um, because you mentioned the, I thought this was fascinating, actually, the multi-layered approach that the US government, the Iranian <coughs> government, have taken towards foreign policy right. um, and, and influence. And uh, I just wonder if you couldn't um, maybe riff a little bit on uh, uh, what you think that approach means for uh, how the Iranian sphere of influence might grow, in particular as developing Asian countries increasingly look to Iran for energy resources. Uh, and here we're talking more than just two, three, four years down the road. We're talking a decadal sort of evolution. I think that when you look at the Iranians and what they're doing, uh, it, it's even though they want to have relations with Asian countries, even though they want to have, whether it's China or Russia or anybody in Central Asia, it, they there's a certain uh, very well-defined uh, component to the revolution itself that hasn't changed and it's not going to change. And that is the, the revolution doesn't stay within the boundaries of Iran. It has to go, it goes beyond. And part of that may be revolutionary, call it nationalistic, call it just uh, designs on hegemony in the region, but they figured out a formula and their formula is if they, can, if they have the resources and the people on the ground to help them carry it out, they can, they'll, they'll do it everywhere. We were approached by the Qataris and the Qataris said you know, years ago, I mean, and the Qataris actually have a somewhat decent relative to other countries in the Gulf, a decent relationship with them. They said, despite the fact that on the surface we actually speak to the Iranians and we have a good relationship with the Iranians and we share this gas field with the Iranians and so on and so on and so on, um, 
we, they're constantly trying to undermine us. They're constantly trying, so they're developing cultural centers and they're in touch with troublemakers and they're creating their own cells and they're moving weapons through here and they're building their own mosques. And he said, we tell them to stop, but they don't stop. And you know, when you look at that, that's the case with friendly countries. So I think we, you know, when you're talking about um, that type of dedication, to the externalization of the revolution, I just, it's hard to see that stopping. They have their marching orders and it's its something that's its gonna continue. Interesting. Um, Greg, uh, uh, to you, you mentioned uh, some of the challenges associated with the, with the IPC. Um, I've actually had some conversations with people who are uh, close to that process and I was actually fascinated by what you said because it basically mirrors what, what, what you were indicating. And I, I wonder if you might comment a little bit on what you uh, uh, either understand or have heard with regard to how the internal political situation in Iran is actually influencing uh, uh, the development of that contract. Well, I think that it, it's hard to get into details about the exact terms of it because we're still, you know, a lot of what we've heard from contacts over there recently is about these successive pullbacks and reviews by committees of parliament, people close to the supreme leader. Everybody wants to have a look at it and mark it up and make comments. Um, but you know, I think they're, they're kind of, there are really uh, you know, two layers to the opposition. One is ideological, just you know, the, the fear that an economic opening might lead to a political opening some, some way. Um, you know, when you think about the long term. Um, and, but also, you know, another side of that is some of the Iranian companies that are involved in the sector, even though they may think, they may see an opening as something that would increase volumes and be good for Iran as a whole, it brings in competitors. It may not be good for the interests of those businesses and individuals. And so there are people who are, are opposed to it simply because they have some sort of monopoly that would be undercut by having foreign companies more involved. <clears throat> That's very interesting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a couple of data points at you, and then I'm gonna ask both of you a question. If you could just sort of uh, uh, entertain it. Um, in 2015, uh, estimated total exports from Iran was on the order of 80 billion dollars. Imports 71 billion. Um, two largest trading partners uh, uh, in in that when you, when you collectively combine with imports and exports were China and then India. Um, and what's interesting about that, and, and I sort of mentioned that in my opening remarks for the panel, was, um, and, and this goes back to something, some work we've done almost 10 years ago now, um, looking at the development of global natural gas markets, uh, much less crude oil markets, is, is India in particular. Um, because it's a country that is uh, uh, fairly underdeveloped, um, uh, has a massive population, uh, and is uh, actually recently undertaken some economic reforms that look fairly positive. And so when you tie all that together, you wonder, well, where is it going to get the energy it needs as it goes forward? Uh, and of course, the United States has been involved in this discussion uh, uh, time and again, um, in particular around nuclear uh, ambitions, around uh, discussions of the construction of a pipeline from Iran to India at one point. Um, but at some point, you have to realize if you're the Indian government, we need the energy. Um, we need a solution. And uh, geographically, Iran and India are natural trading partners. And so it then begs the question, going back to the first question I asked, and then again to the IPC, um, <clears throat> where does that put India? Uh, and where does that put the US in terms of its foreign policy in South Asia and, and, and the Persian Gulf region? I think, I think it is interesting uh, you know, in the sense that uh, you know, if there were India has always treated natural gas as something that is very expensive and to be used sparingly. You know, power, gas-fired power hasn't really taken off there. It hasn't been seen as something they're going to use for that. But if they had a cheaper source of natural gas, a lot of industries that India, you know, Indian industry has assumed is, are non-competitive there, when you think about uh, you know, things like ceramics or plexiglass, or, there are a lot of industries that start to become competitive in manufacturing or in materials like that when you have lower, lower natural gas prices specifically. So I think it's going to be very, there's going to be a strong pull there to try to figure out um, you know, over the longer term, how to get those volumes in. I think this is really kind of a 10 year plus question, but thinking about it from the Indian <coughs> standpoint, the industrial competitiveness you could get and other industries you could enter, if you could make that work, 
is really important. Um, and so I do think this will be you know, potentially a, I, I'm not an expert on US-India relations, but I would think that giving the, you know, depending on what happens with Iranian politics in the future, which is another variable, but this could become a little bit of a strain because there is a very, you know, and one, and one last point on this, it is interesting to see that as China has scaled back on, uh, on Saudi exports and more of that has been pushed out, even with that, you see Iranian exports go, you know, going out to China, but India is also taking vastly increased volumes too. And I think part of that is uh, you know, Indian refiners, after sanctions have gone away, have seen that as both you know, an economically rational source of supply, but also potentially uh, you know, just wanting stronger ties with Iran for all of these long-term reasons. <coughs> Excuse me, let me make two comments. With regard to, to um, Iran's, it was mentioned earlier, they have this idea of a economic resistance. This is the year of the economic resistance, the Supreme Leader's called it, and he's, he's mentioned it several times last year, he mentioned it as well. Um, if you look at the, I mean, natural gas, are, as we look at the challenges that, that, that face Iran in terms of becoming, eventually becoming a natural gas exporter, like, like Greg said, it's, a, you know, it's several years away. So I can't believe the torrent of headlines about, and a lot of it's from Iran itself, talking about its near-term emergence as a major gas exporter. It's totally overstated. But when you look at <clears throat> this idea of economic resistance, a lot of it is geared toward uh, creating an interdependency in the region. So whether it's shipping gas to, um, to Iraq, or the gas pipeline to, to Pakistan, or overland stuff to Afghanistan. What they want to do is, I mean, the idea is if there ever is a snapback of sanctions, right? At this time, they're a little bit more prepared to weather the economic storm that comes, that follows. So that's the, I mean, that's one of the issues I would say. But the other thing too is, even though their, their exports were lower than their imports, I mean, the question is, what is it that sustains the Office of the Supreme Leader and the RGC and the ruling conservative power establishment? It's construction, it's petrochemicals, it's the, it's the industry, a lot of the industries that weren't really that, that, weren't, that are not oil and gas related. I mean, they certainly benefit by uh, stronger revenues in oil and gas. However, uh, you know, life went on for them. And while they were feeling the pressure, they could still go on. And they were still earning 10, 20, 30 billion dollars as a result of their, their big stakes in other, in other industries. Um, I want to open the open the open it up to the floor for questions. So if you have one, please. <coughs> yes. Right uh, what is cheaper for them to export gas uh, LNG or pipeline through Afghanistan to the Western China Line or you know to Pakistan and India? What would be ultimately cheaper for them to accomplish, or would it be cheaper for them to? take that gas and do something with it uh, in the country and export you know, components or, or something like that? My, our understanding was that <clears throat> they wanted to take the gas, generate electricity, and they, they want to actually ex become a regional ex electricity provider. That was one of the things. Until they build up the infrastructure, which is going to take years for them to do, it wouldn't make sense for them now. And, and I say for them, the people are actually earning the margins. And those are, the, again, the powers that be. And for them, that uh, was more, much more profitable endeavor for them to think about how to export electricity, how to generate more petrochemicals than to just produce, than to export raw gas. That's what I heard. Uh, I'll, I'll just add one, one comment to that because we've actually done some work on that issue. Um, the pipeline versus LNG question, particularly when you're talking about uh, near neighbors, so uh, India, for example, it's a knife edge question. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the location of the resources that would actually be the feedstock for either one of those export options or largely in the southern part of Iran. Uh, so when you think about LNG uh, being a close or a near substitute for a pipeline, uh, the one thing that LNG actually brings you that a pipeline doesn't is optionality in terms of delivery. So that's long been a favorite option, particularly for South Parksfield development. Um, now it requires tremendous capital. And uh, even in the current environment, it's unlikely that they'll actually be able to attract that kind of capital into the country. So I agree, it's a long-term issue. It's not a near-term near -term issue. But given the gas resources that the country has, you can't, you can't just turn a blind eye to it. Uh, so I, my question is for Greg. And I should preface my question by saying I trade crude oil um, futures. And my view changes every day, depending on the market. But fundamentally, the market, um, views prices fundamentally on a fixed term outlook. Uh, and the thing that doesn't like at all is uncertainty. Um, so recently, um, I believe yesterday, there was news that 
OPEC, uh, Saudis, and Russians are coming to an agreement, with or without Iran, we will sort of enforce this January agreement to have production. Um, and hopefully this will be somewhat clarified this weekend in Doha. But um, if you look at the crude oil prices, crude oil prices are sort of stabilized around 40. And while it could go down to whatever, the likelihood now is it's probably going to go up um, based on the sort of agreement or understanding or rumor they have in the market. And the same thing you could see in the market, like S&P 500, Dow Jones, whatever. If you look at them, I, I trade them every day. Tick by tick, if the crude oil was going down, Dow Jones was going down a tick. But now that sort of relationship has been broken. So why you knew was that this bull run has sort of grown Peter out, uh, fundamentally, currently at this moment, my view is bullish that um, crude oil has a greater probability of going up um, than down uh, for the uncertainty part. So could you address um, this? I mean, you have the fundamental of production and whatever politics, but also this uncertainty part, how that plays in your view and why you sort of discounted that and had a more of a bearish view on the market. But that all depends on your time frame. I'm bearish short term when you think about the next couple of weeks because I, I don't think you're going to get Iran making any sort of meaningful commitment. Um, and, and the others, they weren't going to, you know, the Saudis weren't expected to raise output this year. Russia has raised output unless you believe they're actually going to shut that back in. So I think they're going to sign something, but it's not going to result in anything not being produced that would have otherwise been produced. Having said that, I, I agree with you about, you know, when you think about, say, from now to the end of the year or from now, three months out from now, we're getting, even with the volumes coming back on from Iran, there's much more light at the end of the tunnel. You're looking at the, the uh, inventory accumulation, the pace of that coming down in the second half with seasonal refiner demand going up, um, and even you know in the first half of next year, potentially coming to inventory draws, or certainly by Q3, you're going to start to hit inventory draws. And so some of the questions that people had, when prices dropped back down in, you know, below $30 a barrel, I think a lot of that was worry about macroeconomic contagion and specifically about a hard landing in China. Um, and once that had receded a bit, um, the market has become a little bit more comfortable with the idea that we're still in slow growth, but we're not going to see some hard landing in China that would knock off, you know, that would bring demand growth down from a million two to a very small positive or even negative number. And that's what the worry was at the beginning of the year. So I, I agree with you when you think that a couple of months from now. Um, but I think the short-term reaction to Doha will probably be mild disappointment. I think you have some supply coming to India rather than a shorter period of time than you come from Iran. That, you know, for example, from Mozambique, uh, you have a huge discovery of natural gas in, uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, it seems to me, and what I'm hearing is that the indigenous supply uh, reserves of, of gas in Iran could be used to develop, as what you were saying, an indigenous industry, uh, whether it be import suit substitution, uh, building uh, gas-fired power plants as opposed to using what they're using. Now, I don't know what their power distribution uh, sources are. Uh, and using that to, uh, to then export more crude oil as opposed to using it well, at the moment, Iran actually, the, most of the gas it produces, a big chunk of it anyway, is actually being used for enhanced recovery. So it's actually being piped north into fields that are, that are old, oil fields. So it has actually been used historically to support oil production. Um, the, uh, the gas resource that we're talking about sort of feeding either the, uh, uh, you know, the proposed Iran to Pakistan to India pipeline or Iran to India pipeline if you bypass Pakistan um, uh, or LNG is uh, uh, primarily in the South Pars field, which is contiguous with the North field in, 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 in Qatar. Um, and that is uh, a largely untapped resource at the moment. So uh, that's why I mentioned the capital requirement to actually do that is enormous because it's a pure greenfield opportunity at this point. Can use the gas. Well, they do actually use a lot of natural gas domestically. A lot of their transportation sector. Yeah, but a lot of their transportation sector, for example, is natural gas driven. Um, Iran has the largest natural gas fleet in terms of proportion of <clears throat> overall transportation than anybody in the world. 
actually. So, you know, it's a, it is a very natural gas intensive economy as it is, but being able to be outward looking in terms of its development could, could trigger additional revenue. And that's a, you know, again, it's a, it's a longer term issue. It's not something that's going to be solved in the next five years. Uh, Greg, uh, with great depth of knowledge you have about yeah. the region, when you look at this collide between Saudis and Iran, um, clearly there are losers and winners. We can open the TV and see the streets of uh, Damascus and Yaman and see the losers. Who are the winners uh, of this uh, situation? <clears throat> If you read, this, if you read the, the stream of press uh, on a weekly basis, at least in the U.S., it's Ira Iran and Russia are the winners. I can't tell you how many articles, I it's like a, a constant stream of articles talking about how, uh, I mean, win winner relatively speaking, I mean, winner in the sense of preventing Assad from cl completely collapsing. So to the extent that Iran has a very important, arguably one of, or the, their most important strategic ally in Levant that is no longer on the verge of collapse, uh, it's, a, it's been a big near-term victory recent victory for, for the Iranians. And it's been a near, it's, it's been a near uh, step forward for the Russians as well. Uh, it, but I mean, to call it a victory, I mean, it, it's, if the Iranians see the fact that everybody's gonna have to be, be engaged in Syria for a long time as an advantage, then you might call it a sustainable victory. But it's certainly, I don't see any indication that the Iranians are gonna be able to say, okay, now we can pack up and go home. In fact, from a financial perspective, the commitment that's going to be required to sustain, I mean, the, this mosaic of groups that they have created all around Syria, not to mention just bolstering up Assad, I mean, it's got to be it's financially draining. It's a, it's, a, it's a gigantic burden. And I think uh, to, to call it a victory is, is, is certainly misleading. But if you were to look at, I mean, I'm just taking a step back and thinking, where is this Iran-Saudi thing going? And, and how do you declare one a winner and one a loser? Um, first of all, I think it's been going on for decades. It's just, and it's just in a different form. And I think when the Al Salman took over in, in January of last year, they, had, they decided they're going to take a different approach. And their approach is hitting the Iranians head on and trying to do coalition building, which, by the way, the GCC has a terrible history of coming to agreement on anything. You know, whether it's creating something that's in their best interests or not. So, you know, when, in the aftermath of the Iranian, uh, of Stuxnet, so the Iranian centrifuges are attacked by Stuxnet. I don't know who did that. Somebody did that, okay? Um, <clears throat> the Iranians came to the conclusion that it was a declaration of cyber war. They viewed that as a declaration of war on them. And they said, okay, we're gonna stop, uh, dust ourselves off here, figure out how to increase uh, our own counterintelligence and industrial security and figure out how to prevent our, 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 us from being attacked again. That's fine. And that made them more stable. It actually worked against us to the degree that it actually made them smarter on all of those various dimensions of security. So they know how to better protect themselves and identify threats. So the, the people who created Stuxnet probably thinking, oh shoot, that didn't work so well. All right. Um, but they viewed it as a declaration of war against them. Okay. And that war means they're hitting us, and they're hitting everybody who we think is against them, whether it's Israel, the United States, Saudi, and otherwise. So that's not stopping. So when you take a step back and say, what is the GCC doing about it? The GCC is trying to figure out, well, the Americans keep telling us, jointness. You guys got to come up. You guys got to embrace this concept that we do in the military called jointness. Everybody works together. And they can't agree on anything. The Saudis and the Bahrainis and the Qataris are with Turks and the Muslim brother, and nobody can agree on anything. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. So that's why when you, when you ask yourself, even though it's hard to say definitively, there's a winner and there's a loser, okay, it's hard not to see the Iranians in a much better position to, they're just, they're much more agile when it comes to asymmetric warfare, when it comes to trying to do the things that they've done for 35 years against the Saudis and against all of their enemies. At the same time, though, I'll say this, in a lot of places, what has it gotten them? You know, I mean, in a lot of places, they failed. So forget about the far-flung places. I'll tell you, I mean, just one story about there's in the region and there's outside the region. In the region, they've got successes and they've got failures, okay? And they're going to continue. But I would argue they've been more successful in the region than outside the region. So when Ahmadinejad was, was, was came, came in in 2005, 2005, he decided, okay, we're, you know, they had, at that time, they had all the oil money that they needed. They had all the money they needed to actually fund the goods force, expand the goods force, and start experimenting, right, in places like Latin America. 
So they went up to Hugo Chavez and the guy in, in uh, Bolivia, and they started to come up with these strategic relationships. And the Venezuelans are like, well, I, I don't know about 12 or Shiism, but you don't know about you know naked women. I mean, so there was no, you know, they were trying to figure out. But nevertheless, there was a there was a there was a strategic compatibility there, which was against the United States. And they realized they could work together. Has it worked? I don't know. In a lot of places in Latin America, it hasn't. So there was a couple of years ago, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs got rid of. 20 or 30 ambassadors because they said, you guys aren't revolutionary enough. We need to put people out there who are, who've got proven credentials, who are revolutionaries. So they went and they said, okay, you're from the Ministry of Intelligence, you're gonna be ambassador here. You're from the IRGC, it goes first, you're gonna be an ambassador there. And all of a sudden, the diplomatic corps in, the, in Iran had these guys who couldn't speak English to anything. So what did they do? When they got in country, they figured, and a guy lands in a place like Mexico City, and this is a true story, he figures he's going to push forward the revolution in Mexico. <laughs> so when he goes to, and he gets credentialed, and he goes before the Mexican Foreign, you know, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they say, well, you know, welcome, Ambassador. Um, you know, what is it you'd like to talk about? And let's talk about your objective, Iran's objectives over the next couple of years uh, in, here in Mexico. And he said, well, he said, we've got two objectives. One, we really want Mexicans to be in touch with 12 or Shia Islam. <laughs> we want to push this as much as possible, try to convert, I know you guys are Catholic, but you know, 99.9%, .9%, but we're gonna to try to convert as many as we can. So they said, all right, that's bizarre, that was odd, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, what's your second, what's your, what's your second um, objective? And they said, well, the second objective is we've noticed that, I know you guys are bordering with the United States. It's a border, a long border. We want to try to put a wedge between you and, and the United States. So if you imagine if you're the Mexican foreign minister and you're listening to this, you don't know what to think. So in, in some ways, as Iran has tried to go beyond its re, you know, the region and, tr and try to you know, be revolutionary, it, obviously it's ridiculous and it hasn't worked. In other places it has. I mean, if you talk to Ahmadinejad, he would say they've made leaps forward in places like Venezuela, right? Where they've got there. Although, what does that mean today? Venezuela's a basket case. Right? Um, and again, how has it really made Iran stronger in a regional or even a global sense? By having an ally that's, I mean, Chavismo is dying and the region is, is moving in a different direction. So their adventures beyond the Middle East, uh, I, I, you know, I would say a lot of them don't work. But when you think about, so getting back, I mean, it's, it's a long way of answering your question, winning or losing. Um, they're more effective at playing the game, but they don't always win. And, see, and again, I think somebody made the point earlier today, Syria, is, it's, it's a complex question who wins and who loses. Because at the end of the day, if you were asked, you know, one of the things that we hear you know, from, from some clients of ours in New York is, wait a minute, we hear about Russia and the Saudis meeting. Are they gonna talk about some grand, some grand bargain to raise oil prices? Because the Russians are desperate. The Russians, Putin wants 375 you know, billion in currency reserves. He doesn't want that thing to dip lower. Who does he have to tax? What does he have to do? How does he get the Saudis to cut production, even though they're not gonna cut production? How are we gonna do that? What can we, what's the quid pro quo? What could the Saudis, what could the Russians offer the Saudis so the Saudis lead the charge in cutting production, right? And we say, well, here are the reasons why they're not gonna cut, but nevertheless, you start to think, what do the Russians really have to offer? And they say, wait a minute, what about Assad's head? The Saudi, if the Russians were to deliver Assad, the Saudis might say, wait a minute, then we'll cut production. And the answer we always go back to is no. Because the Russians, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why they don't want to do that. There's a lot of, they're, they're, there's longevity. They're, they have designs in the region. They have a relationship. I'm not sure they could deliver them anyway. The Iranians have much more influence on the ground there anyway. And at the end of the day, what comes next? If Assad's gone, what comes next? We talk to Syrians, Alawis, who are inside, outside the country all the time. And they say, okay, listen, we hate Assad. But if you get rid of him in the military, it's like Thunderdome, it's chaos there. Mad Max type type of place. What are you gonna do about that? So the Russians know that. And if you look at the Russian strategy, they say, listen, the Americans wanna to try to overthrow them with these, you know, these moderate Islamists. What, what comes after that? At least we're trying to strengthen state institutions and create some form of stability. But we're always recognizing that we're always gonna have probably the eastern half of the country, at least always for the next five to 10 years, at least in a state of chaos. But we can live with that. Does that make them a winner? I don't know. Hard to say. Time for one last question. Go right up here. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things going on in the Middle East right now. We're living in fairly interesting times. Um, the U.S. 
I'm sure is very concerned about the, some of the uh, worries that the Saudis and some of the pressures that the Saudis are under right now. We, we lived and worked for Remco uh, for 11 years, so we were pretty close to, uh, to this. Um, it's very worrisome to us when we see all the things that are going on in Saudi Arabia right now. It feels like we are really uh, going through a real critical time. There's a, a lot of things that are affecting Saudi Arabia at this particular time. Um, they don't have enough gas. They're consuming more and more of their oil every year, 8% a year, and so they're doubling the amount of oil uh, that they consume, leaving less available to export. We've got problems in Yemen. We've got the, 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 the concerns about the uh, potential growing uh, relationship between the United States and Iran. What 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 can the U.S. do to sort of not let that get out of hand? Well, a little of that is is, is not such a bad thing, but but sometimes the people begin to act irrational if if things get too much out of control. I can I can certainly address the um, from from a geopolitical perspective. I'll let you come, Greg, if you want to comment on that uh, from an energy perspective. Um, I, first of all, I would say that the U.S.-Saudi relationship is deeper than people give it credit for. I mean, I think even though there's been friction between the Salmans since they took over, and even though Mohammed bin Salman's done things that nobody's ever dreamed of doing there, and he's taken them in some erratic directions that haven't worked out well, like Yemen. I think the, de the depth of the relationship is better than people give it credit for. Uh, so the question is, what can they do? I think if, you know, when we've gone to Saudi over the last six, six to 12 months, they say, <clears throat> there's not much you can do. The, the US, U.S. policy until President Obama's gone is written. So we're going to bide our time and wait. We don't expect any major changes. There's not going to be any major sea change in U.S. foreign policy towards Saudi, towards the Gulf, towards Iran for the, for the remainder of this term. So maybe President Cruz, when he comes in, he's going to rip up the Iran deal. He's going to restore relations with, with Israel. He's going to re, you know, snap back sanctions against Iran. And then all this will be gone. And we'll be living in a new day. So I think, you know, but, you know joking aside, though, the, the, one of the, the last time we were there, one of the things they asked was, OK, we want to know about shale. What do you think about shale and the sector and so forth and where it is? And that's great. Yeah, because everybody, we're all prepared and excited to talk about that. And all these great insights from Texas. And they said, nah, forget that. We want to know is about Trump. Explain President or would be President Trump. And, and, and so they want to know. But I think it was, it, was an, it was an indication that they have sort of put on hold the idea that there's going to be any major change for the rest of the year. So get to, if your question is, with all the stuff that's going on in Saudi that you mentioned, what can, the US, what can the U.S. do if you were another administration coming in? Um, I think it's just a matter of re I think it's a matter of re-engagement. I really think it is. I think it's a matter of saying, OK, we need a better idea of where Mohammed bin Salman is going. Is, this, is, is he really, he's got an army of McKinsey advisors around him who are telling him, you've got to diversify, you've got to do things nobody did, you've got to you actually define yourself. If you want to actually leapfrog Mohammed bin Nayef, you're going to have to do this, this, and this, and recreate your image. I mean, all those machinations we're all familiar with. Um, but nevertheless, he's thinking about things that, that people have thought and haven't been able to achieve. So if you're the US, how do you re-engage and get on the same page with them in that sense and reassure them that there's no major strategic rapprochement with Iran? And I think the Iranians are doing so much to make that possible. Day in, day out, they're doing that. I mean, the, the Saudi foreign minister, they tried to kill him in Washington. You know, I mean, it really wouldn't be that difficult to reassure the Saudis, OK? And the Saudis have their own problems. We have our own differences. Uh, that we're strategic partners. This, this, was, an, this was sort of a misstep. Let's, we're going back to the way things were. I really, I really don't think it would be. You know, particularly if Iran stays on its course. And I would say, Iran, again, you have to ask yourself, between net for now and the near future, particularly in the run-up to succession. And Iranian succession, again, I would say, there's no more important issue in the next, I don't know, 10 years than that. And if you ask yourself, what's going to happen in conservative circles inside of Iran in the run-up to that succession, it's going to be more of the same. Hardliners. Putting down, uh, uh, putting down markers, shoring up their power, and getting ready for the transition. And, and Rouhani and others try. I mean, there's, an inter there's a difficult internal fight coming. But, be, but as a result of all of that, the, IRGs is gonna, the IRGC and others, are, and, and, and now the Army, are going to be continuing to do things that are disruptive and antithet antithetical to their interests. And, and you know, I mean, whether it's working with Hezbollah, creating new Hezbollahs, things that 
uh, work against Saudi and U.S. interests. So leave Iran to its own devices. Wait, wait for a new administration to come in and try to hit the reset button. I think the Saudis don't expect more than that at this point. Craig? Yeah, on, on the economic side of that question, I, I don't think there's a lot the U.S. can do. I think that the Saudis fully understand at this point that they have to slow down and eventually reverse the growth in their, uh, in their energy consumption and have to use it more efficiently. But they don't want to do that abruptly in a way that would be socially destabilizing. So they want to, that's probably going to get done gradually. They think that they have the financial reserves to be able to deal with that in the short term. The bigger problem for them is when you think about the long term where you know, they've reduced their budget balancing price for crude, but not very much. They have to bring it down a lot further. We're probably in a $65 a barrel price equilibrium world going forward, although there's a good deal of uncertainty about that. Um, and that longer term challenge of bringing down their budget to that level, while they have the 3% population growth rate. And they're consuming more oil all the time. I mean, so, yeah. Eventually, it has to be around a better Saudiization, at least for part of that, in getting Saudis employed and getting those Saudis that are employed to be more productive. But that's a, that's a tough one. So, so given, the, given the nature of the conversation, it's largely sort of shifted to a discussion, and I fully anticipated this actually with the discussion of Iran reentering the oil market, um, uh, of Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, so I'm going to put to you one last question, and then we'll break. Um, who's hurt more by low oil prices, Iran or Saudi Arabia? I think that's, that's definitely Saudi Arabia. I mean, Ar Iran has an economy that's much more diversified. They've got manufacturing, they've got agriculture. Hydrocarbons are a big thing, and, and that hurts them. But you know, look how they've survived sanctions. You know, if you if you took away half of Saudi exports and then had a price collapse, the impact would be a lot worse. So Iran is just the more diversified economy is a big is a big factor there. Yeah, no, completely agree. And I think that if you look at the decisions that are made from the Iranians, it's, I mean, the most important decisions with regard to the economy and sanctions and so forth are made by those who are, who are fine whether they're sanctions or not. And they were showing no signs of, of imminent collapse. As much as the Supreme Leader wanted to turn the corner, get, you know, lead Iran into an economic recovery through the nuclear deal, they could have gone on. And I think, so I think Iran is much more resilient than people think. It was a leading question, but I'll go ahead and follow it up with this. Um, the reason I asked the question is because when you think about the April 17th discussions in Doha um, and the, the potential for a production freeze or even a, a, an imminent, uh, as some would say, cut in production by Saudi Arabia, um, if Iran continues to push forward with trying to expand production and you know, grab market share, do you think Saudi Arabia will ultimately have to relent or can they weather the storm and for how long? I'll give you the short answer, and then I'll give you the more detailed answer. Um, our, our fundamental position is going into the 17th, the Iranians haven't realized everything they can in terms of their comeback. They've done four or 500,000 at most since December of last year. If they can still grow by another two or 300, which gets them to 3.5, 3.6, 3.6, uh, which were pre-sanctions levels back in 2011, they're going to, and they'll, they'll go along with the idea of this artificial verbal intervention everyone's calling a freeze. They'll say, we support the framework if everybody wants to call OPEC, non-OPEC, getting together and propping up prices until the oversupply uh, you know, wears down towards the end of the year. But I think Iran will go along with it. And I think Saudi, I, it, you know, I, Saudi went along with it. One, interestingly, somebody from Saudi said, a very close Saudi observer said, you know, the Saudis go along with it or not, the Saudis don't want prices to go too high because they're not convinced shale's been hit hard enough yet. And they don't want to see a quick rebound to shale. So I just throw those things out there. But we think that they'll, both sides will probably have a, a kind of flimsy support for a framework or freeze. Yeah, I agree. I think that the, the question of whether Iran and Saudi Arabia could divide the geopolitical rivalry from energy would be much more interesting if the Saudis actually believed that production restraint would accomplish their goal. But I think the core of all of this is they just don't see it as some, even if they could get the widespread cooperation that they want, it wouldn't be rational to begin with. Um, and they just see this as something where it's a bad thing, but they have to ride it out, and that's the rational course of action. But that's not going to prevent them from cooperating on jawboning. And particularly when you had the short interest that you did back when we were in the 20s, you know, it wasn't an accident that that massive, unprecedented uh, short interest at that point was exactly when the jawboning started and worked up into a crescendo. And it worked. It, you know, in some ways, it worked, even though it didn't take a barrel off. Great. Well, uh, join me in thanking our speakers, Scott and Greg.
Um, and I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, sticking it out. Um, I know it's hard after lunch, uh, particularly after the uh, after Ambassador Sherman's wonderful, uh, absolutely wonderful speech. Uh, but I appreciate you being here, and hopefully uh, you leave here a little smarter than when you started. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs>